to begin this year. Um, I just want to say that this shear is uh, as it should be as a chut for a refua shalema for Rabbi Sachs. Uh, we hope he will be feeling better and be back to his uh, regular busy contributing schedule. Um, personally, you know, I don't prepare a share without checking to see what he has to say on the subject. So I really hope that he'll be able to continue um, contributing to us. The source sheet is, been, is in the chat for those of you who didn't receive it on the email. Good morning, Oshra, would you like to say something before we continue? No, okay. It's nice to see so many of you returning, but in addition, there are a number of new uh, participants. That is the advantage of the Zoom. And so I'd like to just explain a little bit what we're going to be doing this semester. At the beginning of last... Osher, are you talking to us? Oshra, if you're speaking to us, I don't hear you. Okay, I have to assume that she's not talking to us. Okay, so at the beginning of last year, one of our um, participants said, you know, we'd been doing Parsha for two years. And she said, you know, because we never meet in the summer, we never have a chance to do the summer Parshiot. So that's exactly what we began doing last year. Last year, we began studying the summer parshiot that begin at the end of the book of Bamidbar, and we continued into the book of Devarim. So that is where we are picking up now, and we are going to continue through the book of Devarim, hopefully by the end of this year, to finish with the end of the book. Now, I just want to remind those of you who were in the class last year and some of our new participants that essentially the book of Devarim is Moshe's last will and testament. He is speaking 36 days before he dies and he is giving um, his last wishes, his last reminders to the people before he's about to die. And essentially, the book is divided into four sections. Chapters 1 to 4 are the introduction. Chapters 5 to 26, which are the main speech. And that is where he reviews laws. Some of those laws we met in other books. And some of them are actually new, which we're meeting for the first time now in the book of Devarim. Then we have 27 and 28, which is the covenant, and 29 and 30 are the chapters of Tshuva. So that's just in terms of the background. So we are picking up now in the book, in the middle of this main speech of Moshe, and we are finding ourselves in Parshat Re'eh. So we are going to begin here. Let's do a screen share. We're going to begin here. With the psukim that, that appear in Bamidbar, excuse me, Devarim chapter 12. Ki yarchiv Hashem lokecha et gvulcha, kasher diber lach, veamarta, ochla vasar, Ki ta'aven nafshecha le'echol basar, b'chol avot nafshecha tochal basar. We meet a new law. And that is when you get to the land of Israel, if you want to eat meat, you can eat the meat wherever you want. Ki yarchik memcha hamakom ashe yivchar sham lokech lishum shmo sham. Because you are actually living too far from the mikdash, so 
you no longer, if you, you don't have to wing a kurban in order to eat meat because it's too far. Now, if you want to eat meat, you have to go through the regular shechita process. But at the same time, came to and you, but you have to be careful only to eat the kosher animals. So this is a halacha that's known as basar ta'ava. From this pasuk and pasukhaf, ki ta'ava nafshecha. Now, when I started thinking about this, and I thought about meat in the midbar, I was, and I hope, I assume that most of you are most are familiar with the story of the slav, which we have in Bamidbar Perak Yudalaf. In Bamidbar Perak Yudalaf, B'nai Yisrael complain and they say that they are hungry and that they want meat. And so God says to them, I'm reading in Bamidbar Yud Aleph Yud Chet, I'm going to give you meat because you cry. Because you complained and you said, we missed that meat that we got in Egypt. The whole thing about the slav though was they only got it for a month, right? If we skip down to the beginning of that chapter, the beginning of the chapter tells us, actually going back to where we were in Pasuk Yutet, lo yom echad tochlun v'lo yomayim, you're not going to eat it for a day or for two days, v'lo chamisha yamim, v'lo asaira yamim, v'lo esrim yom, and not five days, and not 10 days, and not 20 days, ad chodesh yamim, you're going to eat it for a month, ad asher yitzay me'apep, it feels like literally coming out of your noses, and then of course this happens, the slav comes, and I'm jumping down to Pasuk Lam Gimel, and Hashem smites the nation a terrible plague. And that place became known as Kivrot Ta'ava. So my assumption always was, and this was something we actually tried to um, investigate, if you remember the beginning of last year, is what was life like for the Jews in the Midbar? So I always assumed that it was just that month that the Jews had the meat that they got through the slav, through those quails. And I was surprised to find when I started researching this year that there's actually a machloket here in the Gemara. In the Gemara in Chulin, there's a machloket between Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Ishmael says on our verse, when it says, that Hashem will expand your boundaries as he has promised you, and you will eat the flesh. Rabbi Shmuel says this verse comes only to permit the cons consumption of non-sacrificial meat to the desire of the people. So that's what we just said, that you no longer have to bring a karban if you want to eat meat. As, on the onset, the meat of desire was forbidden to them. And, and, and this is in the Midbar. Anyone who wanted to eat meat would sacrifice an animal for an offering. And after the priest sprinkled the blood, it was permitted for one to eat meat. Let me just point out that I get this English translation for Separia, the website. And so the dark black, the bold letters are the actual words in the Gemara. The lighter black is the translation to make it understandable. So the Gemara is explaining here that according to Rabbi Ishmael, when they lived in the Midbar, if they wanted to eat meat, they had to bring a sacrifice. Now, if you recall the way the Machan of Yisrael was set up, and we know this on Tchum Shabbos, it was only 2,000 amot in all directions. So it wasn't difficult for somebody who wanted to bring a karban. If they wanted to eat meat, they had to bring a karban, karban, and then they were able to eat from that meat of the karban. But when the Jews entered the land of Israel, and you have Jews living all the way in Dan, and you have Jews living in Beersheba, and you have Jews living on the other side of the Midba, of the uh, Yardane, in order for them to meet, eat meat every time they have to travel to Yerushalayim, it's just not practical. So Rabbi Shmael says, when they entered into the land of Israel, the meat of desire was permitted for them, and they could slaughter and eat meat wherever they chose. Which means that we're now learning something fascinating, that in the Midbar, in addition to the Slav, the Jews actually were able to eat meat. We know that they have cattle. We know they have cattle because remember Ruven and Gad and Chatzis Shevet Menashe say, we have all of this cattle, we would like to live on Eber Hayarde. 
which is sort of uh, changes our whole perspective on what was going on in the Midbar. So then we want to ask earlier though, then if they have this these animals, why are they asking for Slav? That changes that whole story in a different way, but let's leave that for now. And then Rabbi Akiva though says something different, even more fascinating. Rabbi Akiva says, <clears throat> This verse comes only to prohibit from them, i.e. the consumption of meat of an animal killed by means of stabbing rather than valid slaughter. As initially, the meat of stabbing was permitted to them. Rabbi Akiva takes it a step farther. He's saying not only were they allowed to eat meat in the Midbar, but all they had to do was kill the animal. They didn't have, to, it didn't have to go through shechita and they certainly didn't have to bring it as a korban. So what's being changed now is when they enter into the land of Eretz Yisrael, the stabbing of meat, i.e. just killing the animal was forbidden to them and it was only permitted to eat meat only after valid slaughter. So that both Rabbi Yishmael and Rabbi Akiva are saying that when they come to the land of Israel, they can eat meat by slaughtering the animal. Their machlokas is what happened in the Midbar. Rabbi Ishmael says that if they wanted meat, they had to bring a karban. And Rabbi Akiva says, not only did they not have to bring a karban, they didn't have to shek the animal, all they had to do was kill it in a whatever fashion they chose. And interestingly, if you look in source number three, which is the Rambam, the Rambam Lahalacha. In Hilchot Shmita, uh, Shrita, chapter four, he paskins, let's, well, let's read it and then decide. When the Jews were journeying through the desert, they were not commanded to slaughter non-sacrificial animals. Instead, they would cut off their heads or slaughter them and eat as the other nations do. In the desert, they were commanded that anyone who desires to slaughter an animal would slaughter only for the sake of a peace offering. That means if you wanted to bring a karban, you brought a karban shlamim. And he quotes the pasuk. If however, a person desired to cut an animal's head off and partake of the animal in the desert, this was allowed. Fascinating uh, discussion. And the interesting thing is that although Rambam goes along here with Rebbe Akiva. I hope everybody recognizes that. Most of the other Rishonim go with Rebbe Ishmael. So what the Jews actually did in the Midbar is not 100% clear to us, but we do understand why Moshe would be saying this because the nation is about to enter the land and therefore he needs to explain that whatever we've been doing until now is no longer relevant. And in Israel, if you would like to eat meat, you don't have to bring it to the Karban, to the Mizbeach, as a, to the Beit HaMikdash as a Karban, but you also need to go through Shrita. Now, by the way, in the same Psukim, there is also the warning that you can't build a Mizbeach wherever you want, because that's what the Avod Dezara does, that Mizbechot only in the Beit HaMikdash or Mishkan, but, rich, but slaughter, ritual slaughter is allowed wherever you are. Let's continue in these psukim, coming down to source number four. Source number four continues that once we are allowing you to slaughter animals wherever you live, rock, chazek lebilti ochal hadam, but be strong and don't eat the blood, ki hadam hu hanefesh, because the blood is the soul, velo tochal hanefesh im habasar, and you should not eat the soul with the meat. Lo tochlenu, you should not eat it. Al ha'aretz tishpechenu kamayin, you have to spill it on the ground. Lo tochelna, you should not eat it. Lema'an yitav lecha, so that you should be, you should benefit from it. Livanecha acharecha, and your sons after you. Ki ta'aseh hayashar ve'enei Hashem. And in that way, you will be doing what is proper in God's eyes. But there are some offerings, remember, that you are going to have to bring up to the Mizbeach. 
And then when you bring those sacrifices, the blood will be on the Mizbech. You know, they have that, the ceremony of the sprinkling of the blood, which many of us are familiar with from Yom Kippur, Achad Lamala, Achad Lamata. Once the blood is sprinkled, then you will be able to eat the meat. You listen to these things that you are being commanded, again, in order for you to benefit from it, forever. And in this way, you will be doing what is proper in the eyes of God. Now, we understand why that mitzvah of Basar Ta'ava doesn't show up in any of the other books and only shows up in the book of Devarim because it's relevant for the Jews to enter. We also understand that if we're talking about the allowing to eat meat, the Torah would come along and say, and by the way, when you eat the meat, you should not drink the blood. However, if we look back in our other Sfarim, we will see that at least seven other times, the Torah commands us not to eat blood. Now, there are some mitzvot that we are used to seeing over and over. Be kind to the widow, the ger, the amana. We understand why that pasuk comes over and over. They are the um, uh, lowest levels of society and they need to be supported, fine. We understand that the mitzvah of avodah zara comes up over and over because we know what a challenge that was to the people. But the mitzvah of achilat dam, why should that appear seven times? And here you have a, we get parsha as well. I guess you can call it a coincidence. The first time we have mention of the Isor of Dan is actually in Parshat Noach. After Noach gets off the Teva, Vayavarech Elohim et Noach vet bana vayomer lahem pru or vuomer lueta aretz. God blesses them and he says, be fruitful and multiply. Kol remesh asher hu chai lachem yihye laochla. Every creature that moves will now be for you to eat, just as you were able to eat uh, vegetation, now you can eat animals. But, but, big but, you can not eat or drink, I guess would be the proper term, the blood of this animal, but I will also, be, you have to be careful, although you're being allowed now to take, to eat animals, you have to be careful not to take human life, and if you do, you're going to have to um, pay for it, somebody who kills spills the blood of a person, their blood will be spilled. I think we sort of understand why that isur is put into this context. What the idea is once you're being allowed to eat meat, at the same time, you also have to be, uh, you have to be remembered, do not, um, do not eat uh, the blood. And then of course we continue, if we continue, we have in Vayikra. This is the law forever. Just like you're not allowed to eat any of the fat of the animal, you're not allowed to eat the blood. Continuing, Vayikra chapter seven. You cannot eat the blood of the birds and you cannot eat it of the animals. And here for the first time we have it. Whoever eats the dam, it's a really serious punishment. It's the punishment of karate. Wait a minute, so that already takes this into a whole different category. Continuing, and if anybody, Jew or convert, who lives amongst you eats the dam, now notice this expression, Vinatati panai banefesh. We're going to come back and we'll see that expression soon. Vinatati panai banefesh ochelet et adam, vichreti otam mi kerev ama. Whoever, again, we said it's a very severe punishment for somebody who eats the blood. Why? 
כי נפש הבשר בדם היא, because again we have this idea of the blood is the soul, ואני נתתיב לכם על המזבח, and I have told you, I've commanded you to sprinkle it on the מזבח, לחפר על נפשותיכם, in order for you to get forgiveness, כי הדם הוא בנפש יחפר, because again there is the blood becomes the soul. אל כן אמרתי לבני ישראל, כל נפש מכם לא תאכל דם, דף אי קמנדד יו נאצי איף דה דם, והגר הגר בתוכם כי לא יאכלו דם. אוקיי, אתם רואים את האידאה, זה מתחיל ומתחיל ומתחיל. זה הפעם הראשונה שאנחנו רואים את הבוקר של היקרא, הפעם הראשונה שאנחנו רואים את הבוקר של היקרא, אבל יש לנו משהו נוסף פה. לא תאכלו על הדם, לא תאכלו את הבלוד, לא תנחשו ולא תאוננו, ולא תפקס אי מגיע. What is the connection between eating blood and doing magic? In Devarim, the pasuk that we are at, רק הדם לא תאכול על הארץ תשפכנו כמים, right, don't eat it, spill it on the ground. And again, in another couple of chapters in Devarim, we're going to have רק על דמו לא תאכל על הארץ תשפכנו כמים. So I think what we see here is something fascinating. Here, if you see it, if you just see the pasukim individually, you don't get this whole picture. that if we start looking at this picture, it's really a fascinating question that we have to ask ourselves. Why does the Torah repeat this Esau so often? And what is the rationale behind it? And how are we supposed to understand the lesson that we are supposed to learn from it? And therefore, by the fact that it repeats it so many times, I think that it, we realize that there is a serious question here as well. Also, the other questions that I'd like to ask is if we looked at those psukim, the psum clearly said, be strong and don't eat the blood. And the punishment we saw was karate. And on the flip side of it, what was the reward? The reward was it's going to be good for you if you don't eat the blood. Now, personally, I think that many of us, when we see this, our reaction to eating the blood is ew, yuck. I, I think many of us have that feeling. And the Ma'am Loes, um, this is a translation from the Ladino, he writes like this. And just as the punishment for eating blood is great, I'm up to source number 11 for those of you on the source sheets, so is the greatness of the reward for one who avoids transgression, right? It works both ways. If the punishment is going to be very great, then the reward for not doing it is going to be so great. This is so, even though common sense would not seem to warrant such a great reward, since blood is not something man really needs or as an object of his desire. He is not driven by some compulsion to eat blood. How many people have a Yet Sahara? Ooh, I want to drink the blood of that cow. I, you know, I think that this is, I certainly doesn't talk to us today. I do believe that there are certain cultures that they do have certain dishes that include blood. I know there are blood sausages in Germany. There's, I think, some sort of soup, turtle soup or something that uses blood. But I, I really don't think that if you told all of humanity, you have to stop eating blood, I don't think how many people would get worked up about that. And here the Ram Lowy says, that's exactly the point, that this Torah wants to show you that even something that you don't have a desire for, what a wonderful reward it is how much more reward will you get if it is something that you desire and you control yourself? And so from here, men can learn the rewards of all other commandments. As this commandment may be observed easily, since no instinct compels him to do otherwise, and still the reward is great, how much more so in all the other transgressions with the transgressions which the soul of man desires and his instinct works against him, if he avoids them, his reward is doubled and redoubled since he must labor to fight off his instinct. So this is, I think, is a very, very beautiful approach. And it tells us that even mitzvot that are easy for us to do, our reward is great. How much more so will be rewarded for those that are more difficult? Interestingly, though, I bring that because if you look in Rashi, in source number 12, which is in our chapter, Rashi says, however, be strong. Why does it say be strong not to eat the blood? Rashi says, be strong so that you will learn to resist temptation. You learn that the Israelites were inclined to eat blood. 
See, we're taking our position of 2020 and we're projecting it back onto the people who lived in that time period. And according to Rashi, in that time period, people did want to eat blood. Therefore, it's necessary to state be strong. Rashi, though, brings a second position, which is much closer to what the one we've just said. Rabbi Shimon, the son of Azai, says, scripture comes only to caution you and to instruct you to what extent you must be steadfast in fulfilling the mitzvot. If, regarding blood, it's easy to watch out for, since a person has no desire for it, the Torah needs to strengthen you with its admi admonition. How much more so must you be strong with the other commandments? So we have two different approaches here. Were the people in the Midbar desirous of blood or were they not? I think that if you look in the Pshat, the Pshat is really with Rashi. I think by the fact that the Torah has to repeat it seven times and uses that expression, be strong, and offers a reward, and not only offers a reward, I'm gonna show you something, that technically don't eat the blood is one of the Kashrut laws. Kashrut in general doesn't have explanations in the Psukim, but we're going to see here in a minute that these this command actually comes with um, explanations as well. So it makes us wonder whether indeed this was hard for the people to keep. So let's move on to examining now, why can't we eat the blood? So on the simplest level, we can't eat the blood, just like all kashrut rules, because God said so. Now, if any of you are satisfied with that answer, because we don't have the desire for it, that's very simple. You can turn off your mics and continue on for your day. Um, but we're going to study some other explanations as well. And the first is, let's go back to that pasuk. A number of times, and even in our psukim that we're looking at here, the, I'm back in source number four, the pasuk tells us, why can't you eat blood? Ki hadam hu hanefesh. The dam is the soul. Now, how are we supposed to understand that explanation? It seems to be, and the pasuk seems to be saying, that when we eat, when we drink the blood, we're somehow imbibing the actual essence or the life force of that animal. And although we are permitted to eat the meat, we are not permitted to eat the life-giving source of that animal. And you could say, and according to the Book of Jubilees, which is one of the Sifrei Chitzonim, he says, if we go back to that verse here in Noah, it seems to be the connection. What does it say in Noah? You can kill animals, don't kill people. And what is the bridge between those two things? Don't drink the blood because the blood is the, is the soul of the animal. And it was as if you sort of are, I don't even know how to say this, it was like similar to taking a life even. It's similar even to really being involved in a, some sort of murder if you drink the blood. I think the Abarbanel here gives a easier answer for us to understand. And if we jump down to source number 13, the Abarbanel says, Vahatam hashli shi. Notice that I skipped one and two, which we'll come back to. Ki hadam hu makom hanefesh b'gofachai. Now I'm not sure if this is an actual, if Abarbanel believed this in terms of a biological uh, explanation, but he says, where does the soul live? We know that everything has a soul, but you can't see the soul. So according to Abarbanel, he says, where does the soul live? The soul actually lives in the blood. And as the blood travels through all um, of your body, I suppose, think about it, there are no other, I guess, uh, nerves too, but for the most part, every other organ is, stays in its place. Blood travels through the whole body. So Abarbanel says, if you want to know where the soul is, the soul we learn is actually in the blood. We can't see it but we can see blood, shehi bonus o, that does the soul travels in the blood. Barbanel says it's as if you're eating aver minhachai. 
that is if just when you're not allowed to rip off a limb from an animal and eat it, if you actually ate blood, it'd be considered like you're eating aver menachai. Kemoshu chai beguf v'hanefesh, because that is the soul of the animal. And we already know from the time of Noah, Jews and Gentiles are forbidden to eat the limb of a live animal. And therefore, if you eat the blood, it says even if the animal is dead, the blood still has a life to it, and it would be aver min hachai. The Shadal goes in this direction in source number 14, and he continues and says, near air, shemalamei ika isaro, he takes it as differently. He says, technically, right, you shaft an animal, you put a cup there, you fill up the blood, and it would literally be still warm from the blood's, blood of the animal, and you would drink it. He says, that is a ma'aseh achzarit gedola. He says, there's a terrible cruelty in that. He says there are certain warrior cultures that had this, a vic in terms of victories, they would drink their um, victim's blood. And I think we can relate to this. Remember that picture of the lynch in um, the Palestinian Authority when they raised their hands to show the blood of their enemies on their hands. Nikrash. And Shadal says, so even after they've cooled off, we can't allow you to drink it then either. So it seems to be that this very first approach is that somehow the blood and the soul are integral, are one unit. And because of that, although we're allowed to eat meat, we are not allowed to drink blood. And therefore, we could also understand, not only do you know this, but not as you put the blood on the floor, there is also a mitzvah to cover the blood. There's a bracha that you make when you cover the blood. And this essentially is a saying that although we are killing the animals, there's a certain amount of discomfort here. There's a certain amount of connection to killing, connection to taking the lifeblood, and therefore we do not use that lifeblood. But does that bring the animal back? Does that, although the Pasuk says this, it's not, it's a little bit difficult, I think, for us to completely buy this answer. So let's continue on to answer number three. Answer number three belongs to the Rambam. And we've seen this answer in the Rambam connected to a number of things. In a number of places, the Rambam seems to indicate that many of the mitzvot were given in order to move us away from idolatry. And the Rambam says, blood was considered impure. I'm reading also not from Halacha, but from the Guide to the Perplex, Moray Nebuchim. Blood was considered impure by to men of the Saba, who are pre-Islamic pagans, and still they ate it because they thought it was the food of demons. And whenever anyone ate it, he could cooperate with the demons. Let me remind you, if we look at that Pasuk back in Vayikra, in source number eight, in Vayikra Perak to Yutet, it told us, don't eat the blood and you shall not do magic. And we wondered, what's the connection? So here the Rambam is explaining to us that people would drink the blood and they thought that that would give them some sort of power to communicate with the demons. And there were people for whom eating the blood was repulsive in their own opinion. And yet they would slaughter an animal, catch the blood in some vessel or in a ditch, and they would eat the meat of the slaughtered animal near its blood. And imagine that by doing so, the demons were eating the blood, which is their food. Okay, I don't necessarily understand how this works. But I do understand that Rambam is explaining that there he is familiar with certain people who used the blood for magic. And the Torah comes to recognize it, to remove the stubborn illnesses and strengthen the prohibition of it as it did equally concerning idol worship. Now, what's nice about this Rambam is A, it explains to us why it shows up so many times, just the way Isar Vodazara shows up so many times, here to the Isra of drinking blood, because there is a connection between Avodah Zara and drinking blood. 
as it says, and the Rambam tells us, I will set my face again the person who eats their blood, eats that. Remember, I showed you this pasuk in Vayikra. Vinatati panai binafshi. That expression only appears one other time in Torah, and that is connected, according to the Rambam, with the Isser of Molech. So that you have the same pasuk appearing by blood, you have the same pasuk appearing by Molech, hence it is a connection to Avodah Zarah. So according to the Rambam, you cannot drink blood because of the use of blood for pagan rituals. Now, archaeological evidence, although we have not found, by the way, any archaeological evidence which proves that there were other cultures that used blood like this, we do have an Akkadian account of creation called Enuma Elish, which was written in the 7th century BCE. And in that Babylonian epic, man was created from clay and blood, the spilled blood of one of the evil gods. So you see that according to these ancient Babylonian um, uh, epics, that indeed there is some combination with gods that have blood and they become part of man. So we can understand here that the Rambam wants to move, and Torah said, actually wants to move so far away from this that says you can't have anything to do with it whatsoever you must get rid of it. So, so far we've seen basically three explanations why you can't eat blood. One, because God said so. Two, because some the blood is the soul. And three, the blood is connected to Avodah Zara and therefore we have to remove it. Answer number four, I think is also hidden, hidden at in the verses. And let's look at the Rambam in source number 16. We're gonna come back to the beginning of it. But let's look here at the um, end of the Ramban in Surah 16. He permitted them to slaughter animals because their life is for man, i.e. animals' life. But the life within them should provide atonement for man and be sacrificed before the Blessed One and not be eaten since no creature can eat life itself because all the lives belong to God, as do the lives of man. I think the Ramban is using this pasuk back in source number eight. In source number eight, Vayikor Yud Zayin Yud Aleph, it says, Ki nefesh habasar badam, right? We've already established that, that the soul is in the blood, but this pasuk takes it a step further. Ve'ani netativ lachem al hamizbeach. God commanded us to sprinkle this blood on the Mizbeach. Now, why do we have to sprinkle the blood on, miz, on the Mizbeach? Lechaper al nafshotechan, in order to give you forgiveness. Now, part of the um, Karban practice was technically when a man sins, let's talk specifically about the Khatat, he owes his life to God. And the animal is taking the place. And the sprinkling of the blood is what gives man forgiveness. If man was allowed to drink that blood, it would sort of be mocking the atonement process. How could you ingest that which is supposed to be taking your place? And so that is what the Ramban is saying. He's essentially saying that it can't do two things. You can't, it can't eat it and atone, one or the other. And I think it's clearer if we look in source 17, with David Svi Hoffman on those verses in Vayikra says, ad hadam shal The blood of these animals was on the Mizbeach. Sham yuchalhu l'shamesh l'kaparat b'nei adam hachotim. There its job was to bring man forgiveness. Nefesh b'alei chayim misamelet et nefesh ha'adam. So before we said that the nefesh of the animal was in the blood, here Rav David Svi is taking it a step further. And he's saying it's the human nefesh that's in the blood. And what is bringing man atonement 
And this is taking humanity's place. It's inappropriate for man to eat it. And the Ralbag in source 18, also in Vayikra, says something similar. And this is the explanation that we're given about uh, drinking blood. Because God commanded it as a forgiveness on the Mizbeach. And therefore, God prevented us from eating from eating it. So that you understand that the sprinkling of the blood on the Mizbeach, that is the atonement. And therefore, and therefore it has such a terrible punishment. Why is the punishment of karet for eating the blood? Because you're getting hana'a from something that has um, religious, spiritual, important connotations, and therefore humanity should be removed from this. So this is a very spiritual type of answer, but I think it one that uh, makes sense because it has a job to do. And therefore, because its job is so important, you can't use it for mundane everyday practices and humanity should not be allowed to get um, pleasure from it. If we move on now to answer number five, answer number five uh, is one that we see in a number of the um, Rishonim who say that when you eat the blood of an animal, it becomes part of who you are. Now, I don't know if you're meant to have taken this actually physically, if the Rishonim physically believed that there is a mixture of your blood with the animal's blood, or it's meant to be taken in a spiritual concept, and I'll show you both. So if we look at source number 19, Rabbeinu Bachya in Vayikra says, because blood represents the animal life, and it is improper for us to mix that nature with our nature, that when you drink the blood, you're mixing animal nature into your body. We saw this, by the way, with kashrut. According to the Sefer HaChinuch, which we'll see in a minute, you are what you eat. So we're commanded to make our nature soft and merciful, not cruel. And if we ate the blood, our souls would give rise to the cruelty and rudeness of the nature as it was like the beastly soul. If you drink blood, you will become like an animal who behaves only on instinct. And we certainly want to move far away from that. The soul of man will not be contaminated by the animal's blood, which will lead man to inhuman activity. Again, it's not here clear to me whether he means physically or spiritually, but either way he wants mankind to be separate from the animals and so that their nature should become ours. Ramban says something similar, eating blood makes us like animals. If we were to eat the blood, the life of all flesh, it would then attach itself to our own blood. That makes it sound very physical to me. And they would become united in our hearts. Their blood would start flowing in our veins. And the result would be a thickening and coarseness of the human soul. So it would closely approach the nature of the animal which soul, which resides in what we eat. And finally, the Sefer HaChinuch says, you can acquire bad traits from their blood. Eating blood makes us acquire wicked traits, right? You are what you eat. And if you eat blood, when man consumes from the animal physically similar to him, the thing, the very thing on which his life depends and which his soul is connected, the blood, he acquires his traits. So this is a very interesting idea. And um, if we go back actually to a point that we made earlier, and that was, you'll notice the Torah said, don't drink the blood. And if you don't drink the blood, lema'an yitav lach, so that it will be good for you. Many of you should have recognized that expression, lema'an yitav lach. 
Lemani Tavlach only appears connected to three commandments. Three commandments, Lemani Tavlach. One, honoring your parents. Two, chasing away the mother bird. Three, don't eat the blood. So Abdabit Tzvi Hoffman says there has to be a connection between these three. So what is the idea in his mind, he says, of what is honoring your parents and sending away the mother bird? Both of them comes from acts of chesed, kindness, to treat, we have to be, we have to treat properly, we have to treat animals properly. So in his mind, this whole idea of then is not drinking the blood also has to come from an element of not being cruel, and not only not being cruel, but teaches us a lesson of kindness. And finally, our final answer that we're going to bring today is again in the Rambam, continue to the source we brought before, but I put it again here later. Rambam also mentions to us, by the way, blood, animal blood, and nevela, which are animals that died by themselves, are indigestible. So this goes against everything we've said till now that we drink the blood, it becomes part of our digestive system. Rambam says it does not, but is injurious as food. And therefore you cannot eat the blood because it is harmful for you. So let's take a look at what we have seen till now. What we have seen till now is that the Torah specifically states in seven different places that you should not drink the blood and you have to be careful not to. And we've given, I think, six different explanations about why you cannot eat the blood. A, because God said so. B, blood is the soul and you cannot eat the soul of anything. C, it is to separate us from idol worship. D, it has a function on the Mizbeach to give forgiveness to people and therefore it cannot, you cannot eat it. A, B, C, D, E, it separates human from animal and we should not have any of the animal traits within us. Or finally the Rambam that is just unhealthy to eat it and therefore the Torah is commanded to us not to. Now, very much connected to this question of the not eating the blood brings us back, I think, to this question of eating the meat. If we're not allowed to eat the blood for all of these reasons, and we shouldn't become, it shouldn't become part of our nature, and it shouldn't teach us cruelty, we then really have to ask the question, though, then why are we allowed to eat the meat? And let's go back and look at the pasuk that we started with. If we go back to this pasuk in source number one, very first source that we started with, does it sound like it's a mitzvah to do it? It says, When God expounds your batteries, as he promised you, and remember at the very end of last year, we spoke about why it doesn't say the name Yerushalayim. Ve'amarta, ochla basar and somebody wakes up in the morning and they say, I'd really like some meat. The way it sounds is it's not necessarily a um, positive type of thing. And it uses that word tavat nafshecha, which I reminded you with that story in the Midbar, when Bnei Yisrael wanted the meat, the place where they eat the meat is called Kivrot hataava. So I think when you read this verse, you're supposed to remember that. And so it sort of it makes it sound from this pasuk that Torah is allowing it, but isn't necessarily crazy about it. And I think this is something that many of us are familiar with, but I just want to show you how it develops. So the very first thing you want to I want to show you here is interestingly enough, is the Rashi on our Pasuk. The Rashi in our Pasuk on verse number 20, Rashi says, when God expounds your battery, your boundaries, and you say, I will eat meat, the Torah is trying to teach us proper conduct that one should not desire to eat meat 
unless one lives in abundance and wealth. Now, I don't see how Rashi sees that. That's not, he quotes, I mean, it is from the Gemara in Hulin. Um, it doesn't seem to be the Pshat. And Torah, it's not very usual for Torah to give financial advice. So you see that Rashi is uncomfortable with, with the Pasuk, and he takes it in this direction, but it is certainly not the Pshat. And so we're going to do a little bit of a historical um, survey here. And I think source number 24 is a source that most of us are familiar with, but I hope again here, I'm going to show you something new. The Gemara in Sanhedrin 59b says, man was not permitted, meat, excuse me, meat was not permitted to Adam, the first man for consumption. As it's written, God says to him in Breshit, you can eat of the vegetation. It should be for you and for every animal on the earth. And it is derived that God told Adam, eating vegetation is permitted to you, but eating the animals of the earth is not permitted to you. And I think that this is the way we've all grown up, understanding that Adam did not eat meat in the Garden of Eden. But when the children of Noah came, God permitted them to eat meat as it stated in the Pasuk we saw earlier. Now you can, as the green herb, I have given you all. And we, I don't know about you, but I always grew up learning that why was Noah allowed to eat that meat? Noah is now allowed to eat that meat because he saved the animals, so it's if the animals owed him one, and so now he was able to eat meat. The problem with this is that the same, very same Gemara continues a couple of lines later and says, Rabbi Yehud ben Detema would say, Adam, the first man, would dine in the Garden of Eden and the ministering angels would roast meat for him and strain wine for him. The snake glanced at him, saw his glory, and was jealous of him. So then, of course, the Gemara continues and says, wait a minute, you just said five lines ago that Adam was not eating meat. So here, the Gemara continues and says, the reference here is to meat that descended from heaven and that was created by a miracle and was not the meat of animals at all. Fascinating discussion. However, the Tosafot on this Gemara says that Adam was actually not allowed to kill animals for meat, but if he came across a dead animal, then he would be allowed to eat meat. That it's not that he was forbidden to eat meat. What he is forbidden to do is kill the animal. But a dead animal, he would be allowed to eat. He does not have the mitzvah of shrita. And then I saw the Ralbag, source number 25. Source number 25 says, Mivoar, mitzad ha'iyun, umitzad ha'torah, Wait a minute, the Gemara that we just read and the way we all grew up essentially were saying that God changed his mind. That first God said, you're going to be vegetarians. And then God said, oh no, you're not. And the Rabbag said, Listen to that language. He says, this is a terrible lie. He says, for you to come along and say that God changes his mind, that God didn't realize when he created man one thing and he would allow him to do something else. And anybody who has any intelligence should run far away from this expression of God changes his mind. God doesn't change his mind. And then if we go into the Shadal, who lived a little later, he also writes, Yesh lishol. Lama lo is kira hilata basar lo es ladam velo etzel hachayot? Why doesn't it mention 
that man ate meat. Ukvar he'eminu rabim, and I have to admit that I was one of them. He says, many believed that God did not allow the slaughter of animals before the mabul. But this is really far. Me'achar, listen to the sentence. Me'achar, shahadam b'tiv'o u'baharchavat gufo u'b'tzurat shinav hu mukhshar la'achilat hazra'im v'habasar b'shaveh. He says, look at the way human, and specifically the mouth. Look at the way the mouth is created. Animals that only eat vegetation don't have two sets of teeth. The fact that God created us with two sets of teeth, according to Shadal, indicates that from the beginning, God intended for man to eat meat. When God said to mankind, you should rule over all of the chayot asadeh, that meant that you could eat meat. And God repeats it only to Noah, and the only reason it's repeated again, according to the Shadal, was to warn man not to kill people. And by the way, he has another proof for this. The other proof of this is, if man is not allowed to kill animals, how come Hevel is allowed to bring a sheep for a carbon. Okay, think about that. And then let's think about some other stories. If we start going through some of those stories in Breshit, we see that indeed meat plays a very central role. When, Ad when Avraham wants to greet his guests, what does he feed them? He feeds them animal meat. If it's only a Bidyevit situation, then we would expect Avraham not to give them meat. Yitzchak, he wants to give the bracha. What does he ask for? He asks for matamim. What does Rivka prepare for him? Shtei gedei izim. In order to be yotze, in the korban Pesach, you have to eat meat. So that on one hand, we are having this question about how do we look about the eating of meat? And yet, on the other hand, we have this idea that men in Gan Eden, everybody seemed to think that that was the ideal. But yet we see now that perhaps he was allowed to eat meat. So let's sort of go through the, what we would call the stages of meat eating. So first of all, let's start with man. Was man allowed to eat meat? Machloket. We had the Gemara that said he wasn't. Then we had the idea that he was given meat from heaven. And then we had the third opinion from the Tosafot that he was allowed to eat meat, but he wasn't allowed to kill the animal. Then we come to Noah. Now let's go back to that Ramban that we skipped in, I think it was source 16. The Ramban, yes, in source 16 told us, and this is in Vayikra, interestingly enough, because God created all the lower beings for the needs of man, since he alone among them recognizes his creator, only humanity accepts God as king, and therefore that puts humanity on a level above all other creations. Nevertheless, he did not originally allow them to eat anything except plant life. So the Ramban is going the direction of the Gemara, that originally man was not allowed to eat anything other than plants, and after the flood, he permitted them to slaughter animals because their life is for man. And their life was saved because of man, and therefore they're allowed to eat meat. Then that brings us to the Jews in the Midbar, the discussion that we started with. Was, were the Jews in the Midbar allowed to eat meat? Yes. Did they have to slaughter it? Or did they have to bring it as a, oh, and bring it as a kabad? Or were they just allowed to kill it? That's the machlokas between the Rebbe Akiva and Rebbe Ishmael. And then of course, this brings us to the Jews once they enter the land. Once the Jews enter the land, they are permitted to slaughter and eat meat without having to bring sacrifice. 
because of the distance to the Beit HaMikdash was too great, but they have to be careful to slaughter it, not to build a Mizbeach, and to be careful about the blood. Now, if we come down to source number 27. Source number 27 is a Gemara in Baba Metziah. The Baba Metziah explains that Rabbi Yehuda HaNasi had a terrible stomach ailment that he suffered from. And there was this whole discussion in the Gemara, why did he suffer? Uh, if you suffer in the Gemara language, you're being punished for something. So the Gemara stated that Rabbi Yehuda HaNasi's suffering came upon him due to an incident. What was that incident that led to his suffering? The Gemara answers that there was a certain calf that was being led to slaughter. The calf went and hung its head on the corner of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi's garment and was weeping. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi said to it, to the calf, go as you were created for this purpose. It was said in heaven, since he was not compassionate toward the calf, let afflictions come upon him. In other words, a midah keneged midah, he was, he, aff afflictions came to the calf and therefore he was afflicted. Now we just said that the Jews are allowed to eat meat. So what do we do with this Gemara in Baba Metziah? So the Gemara in Baba Metziah seems to indicate to us, as does I think the whole idea of the blood is to tell us that we are allowed to eat meat, but we're supposed to realize that there is something problematic. And we are obviously not on the level of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, and that somehow um, it does affect us in a negative way. And when he says to the animal, this is what you were created for, the kach no tzart, this is what you are, it is a certain amount of negative character in the human being. Now, many of you are also familiar with, with the approach of Riv Cook. Now, I always believed that Riv Cook was a vegetarian and I learned that he was not, although he recognized it as being a, um, a value, he himself was not a vegetarian, but he writes, and the time of this conquest, i.e. the eating of the meat has not yet come. Therefore, sometimes meat will be used as a food as the price of a passage into a brighter era. This is the essence of morality when it is joined to its divine source, that it is recognized that there is a time for everything and sometimes it closes off its wellsprings in order to gather strength for time to come. Thus, the commandment concerning the eating of meat appears in stages, which I showed you, which leads to the highest goal. The covering of the blood of the beast or fowl is the recognition of shame which is the being of moral healing, right? That's the very first step, is to realize that there's a problem here. You may remember and feel ashamed that I have forgiven you. Cover the blood, hide the shame. These deeds will bear their fruit. If we do this is mitzvah long enough, a, as the time goes on, the generations will be educated. The silent protest will, when it time comes, will turn into a roaring voice with a great magnificent sound and its way will succeed. And I think there we understand that idea. Now, I don't know, maybe you'll tell me otherwise, but 40, 50 years ago, how many people were vegetarians? Here, Po Visham, you met somebody. Today, I think it has become much more common all over the place. I mean, whoever went to a wedding and had vegetarian meals in the past. Now it's quite acceptable. All restaurants have vegetarian options. It has become, and I think that that's what uh, Rev Cook here is saying, is that there is this, and this is something we've spoken about, I think, many times, 
that the world is changing, that there is a moral transition that is going on that we are all taking part of. So I think that there is an idea that eating meat is a moral problem. It's one that we're allowed to. It is one that we have. Animals are God's creations. And the mitzvot were given to us for us to recognize it, cover the blood, hide your shame. Now, I do want to point out that living now in 2020, there's also the de development now of meat that's being made in the laboratories. And this has opened up a whole new um, world of halakha, by the way. The question is, that meat is being built from one cell. Is that considered aver minhachai? It, what, does the cell have to come from a kosher animal? Will that meat be flashix? All kinds of these questions are developed now, but I think what we are seeing is that the world is progressing to a point, and I really believe that 20, 30 years from now, our grandchildren are gonna look at us and say, ew, you ate real meat? And I think that is going to be a question. But more importantly, I think the idea here is also that the whole idea of the command to eat meat and the whole stilling of blood comes back to what we saw in this week's Parsha. And that is that it is a uniquely Jewish practice to um, drain the blood from meat. And it's supposed to have a profound moral impact on our practitioners. Just the way we are so careful with the blood of an animal, how much more so would we have to be careful about, God forbid, spilling human blood? And that becomes the idea that a ritual law is here in order to teach us to be more sensitive to humanity. And of course, our discussion would be incomplete without mentioning, therefore, the irony of the blood libel. The chutzpah, almost to say, of coming along and saying that Jews need blood to put it into their matzot goes against everything in the Torah. And it really even becomes difficult even to us to understand how anybody would even believe that story. I'd like to actually end with a fascinating story that is told about Shar Yashuv Kohn. Harav Shar Yashuv Kohn, who was the chief rabbi of Haifa, who was the son of the Nazir of Yerushalayim, the Talmud of Rav Kook. Now Rav Kook was not a vegetarian, but the Nazir was. Now, one time, Rav Shai Yashuf Kohn found himself at the Lubavitcher Rebbe in New York. Now, they actually had a relationship. The Lubavitcher Rebbe's fa uh, father-in-law was saved by Shai Yashuf Kohn's grandfather. So there was a relationship that they knew each other. And so when Shai Yashuf came, came to the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Rebbe said to him, I'm not questioning you because I understand that you're just continuing in your father's way. But I'm really trying to understand how your father could have excused himself from eating meat. Shabbos, Yantif, as we pointed out, Korban Pesach. So how could he come along and say that he isn't going to eat meat? And Rav Shar Yashuv says about himself that standing there in front of the Lubavitch Rebbe, he had like a ha-ha moment, and he asked the Rebbe to bring a book called Stay Chemed. And the Stay Chemed has an entrance called Achilat Basar, and he quickly turns through the book, and he found this quote that he says to the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Aval Ashrei Mi Sheochal Limnoa Atzmo. Lucky is he who is able to survive without the food. And then he quoted in the name of the Kabbalists who say that you shouldn't eat meat, definitely shouldn't eat meat during 
the week. That's for sure. And then it says, And then even so, you should just, well, you shouldn't eat it during Chol. There is an idea of also continuing with that practice on to Shabbat. The Admar looked at Shai Yashav Kohn and said, Nitzchuni b'ni, you win. And that is the story that he tells. So um, let's see, let's stop the share. Um, so I think that this discussion of meat and blood does definitely connect to our Pasho this week by coincidence. And I think it has a, 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 a tremendous um, moral lesson for us. And I think there's a tremendous amount here for us to think about. Let me open the floor to comments, um, questions. I'm sure this is a topic many of you have thought about before, at least certainly, if not about the blood, certainly about the meat. Also, there's the issue now also of the um, harm that the animals are causing to the environment. That's also, I guess, something that needs to be thought about during this discussion. Roberta, go ahead, question. Yeah, it bothers me um, with the carbonate. I mean, that was, you know, they're supposed to do, but all these things that we just learned now, a lot of them, you know, nullify about doing right. a car. So if you recall, Roberta, last year, or two years ago, we did a share on the carbonate, and there was a very question whether there will be carbonate in the future. Mm -hmm. It's not 100% clear that there will be because of everything that you're saying. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then. If uh, then nobody has any other questions, uh, look forward to seeing you all next week when we talk about profits and false profits. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, Hannah.